and hand it over hand it over to our moderator Marcella Movit. Thanks so much, Long, and thanks to all of you for joining us for today's webinar on promising practices for co-enrollment. Today, and it's hard to believe, but it is November first, twenty twenty-three. I don't know where the year has gone. Um, before we get started, I wanted to share with you a little bit about our Universal Technical Assistance webinar. Um, I see lots of familiar names, so many of you already know this, but in case today is your first time joining, um, today's session is part of the Lynx Universal TA Wednesday webinar series. This is a monthly series that we offer through the Lynx project that covers topics that are important to you as members of the field. Uh, the intent of this webinar series is to support states in building their capacity in some very important areas. And as Long mentioned, this webinar will be recorded and this and others in the series will be available on our Lynx YouTube channel. Before we jump in, I wanted to share with you some related resources that we have available through Lynx. On the right-hand side of the page, you see a series of QR codes. Um, the one on the top will allow you to access the federal initiatives that are related to this topic. Um, and those are initiatives like Moving Pathways Forward. Um, below that, on the right-hand side, you'll see a, a QR code to access the resource collection. And in our resource collection, you'll find resources such as the Integrated Education and Training Design Toolkit and Train the Trainer Resources. Um, the next QR code on the right-hand side give you access to the learning portal. And in our learning portal, um, you'll be able to access online courses such as Creating Adult Pre-Apprenticeships and the Integrated Education and Training Design Toolkit. And last, certainly not least, at the very bottom uh, right-hand side of our screen, you'll see a QR code to help that will allow you to join a community within our Lynx community, specifically the um, Career Pathways and Post-Secondary Transitions uh, group is a great place to continue the discussions that will be starting today, but I do encourage you to check out all the other wonderful uh, groups that are there as well. It's a great resource. All right, so uh, today we have with us some incredible presenters. For those of you who are with us uh, regularly in the series, you'll hear me say that every time, but today's no exception. And I'm really excited to introduce all of our presenters um, to you. Um, first up, <laughs> we have with us Latoya Neeson, who is the Director of Adult Education and Literacy. In this role, she oversees the administration of the AFLA Formula Grant Program to states, assistance to states to improve program quality, accountability and capacity, and national leadership activities to enhance the quality of adult education. We also have with us Chrissy Klinger, who is a workforce development specialist at the Institute for the Study of Adult Literacy at Penn State. She also serves as the Career Pathways and Post-Secondary Transitions Group Moderator for the Lynx community. So she'll be the one helping to facilitate those discussions if you do join our Lynx um, community group. Amanda Harrison is the chief of the Pennsylvania Department of Education's Bureau of Post-Secondary and Adult Education's Division of Adult Education. And she has been the state director of adult education for Pennsylvania since 2014. Um, Erica Luce is the manager of adult of the adult education team within the Michigan Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity Workforce Development. Um, she spent the majority of her career working on initiatives and efforts to increase access to the services for adult learners in Michigan. Hector Martinez is the Director for Adult Education of the Kansas Board of Regents. And prior to this position, he was the Director of the Garden City Career Connection Academy at the Garden City Community College for 14 years. And last but certainly not least, uh, Wendy Swearingen has been the State Director of Alaska Adult Education and GD programs for four years. And previously she spent several years working on VOA Title I and three writing and administering grants and was the employment counselor in the Juno Job Center. 
as I said, fantastic speakers. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Latoya to get us started. All right, thank you so much, Marcella. Well, we're gonna begin with an overview of co-enrollment and just provide you some background information on the importance of co-enrollment and then you will get to hear from some of our great practitioners in the field. So one of the purposes of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, as we all know, WIOA, is to bring about increased alignment and service delivery across the workforce development system and help individuals succeed in the labor market. The legislation outlines one strategy for doing this in its description of the Unified State Plan. WIOA says that the Unified State Plan shall describe how the lead state agency with responsibility for the administration of the core program will implement the strategy described in paragraph 1E, including a description of the activities that will be funded by entities carrying out the respective core programs to implement the strategy and how such activities will be aligned across the programs and among the entities administering the programs including using co-enrollment and other strategies. An example of how co-enrollment might be addressed in a state plan is in Pennsylvania, one of the states you'll hear more from later today. Pennsylvania state plans goal 5.3 is, the Commonwealth will increase training to its all frontline staff on all available program offerings to allow for informed internal and external referrals to additional services and facilitate serving the holistic needs of the customer. By being enrolled in multiple partner programs, the holistic needs of the customer can be met. One partner or program can't always meet the needs of every customer. In Pennsylvania, a work group with members from the Pennsylvania Career Link Partner Programs is developing a series of asynchronous online training modules to support this work. The online modules are available anytime, anywhere for all partner staff to complete and have a better understanding of the services that each partners offer, um, that each of the partners offer, which can lead to more effective referrals, which can also lead to more co-enrollment among we old partners. Later, we will hear more from Pennsylvania on how they track co-enrollment among we old partners. So, Let's take a step back. What exactly is co-enrollment? The General Accountability Office, or GAO, you'll hear us talk about that a lot today, explains it simply as participation in multiple core programs. We'll look at what those core programs are in just a bit, but the idea is that an individual may benefit from receiving an array of services offered by multiple programs to support them as they work to meet their goals. We owe a section 116D2I specifies that state performance reports must include a number of participants who are co-enrolled in more than one core program. If states don't report on co-enrollment in their statewide performance report, they actually can get sanctioned. As you can imagine, it requires a great deal of alignment to coordinate uh, and the coordination of WIOA programs. So in addition to um, what is in WIOA, the GAO reiterates the importance of the requirements and of better collection and reporting in its report, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, additional steps needed to help states collect complete enrollment information from November of 2022. In the report, it says that the GAO further recommends that the Departments of Labor and Education work together to better collect complete information on co-enrollment. The GAO also notes that both departments agreed with, this recommend, with these recommendations. So let's begin today by talking about some of the key partners in the workforce development system, which is aligned to the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. On the screen, you can see two lists that come from the Career Pathways Toolkit. We will add the link into the chat of the full uh, toolkit. On the left side, we see a list that is uh, in blue. This list includes the WIOA core partners, that is, 
Title I, Adult, Youth, and Dislocated Workers. Title II, Adult Education and Literacy. Title III, Wagner-Pizer Act Employment Services. And Title IV, which focuses on supporting individuals with disabilities. On the right-hand side, we see a list that is in red. These are additional WIOA partners that may or may not be located within the American Job Center. Many of the adult learners that we serve through Title II can often benefit from services that at least one of the partners on this list provide. When an individual enrolls in one or more of the partner programs that you see on this slide, they are considered co-enrolled. Since different partners have different requirements for enrollment, participants must meet the requirements of both partners' programs to be fully co-enrolled. For example, if a Title II provider refers an adult learner to the Title I youth program, the individual will need to complete the enrollment requirements to become a Title I youth participant and to be co-enrolled. The referral alone does not consider or is not considered co-enrollment. So let's take a moment to identify some of the benefits of co-enrollment. When programs co-enroll participants, participa participants can access a multitude of supports that would not be possible by just one provider. For example, test fees, work clothing, food, and transportation can be provided by partners to help an adult learner become successful in education and training programs. Additionally, co-enrollment benefits, uh, co-enrollment benefit programs by reducing duplication of services and helping staff focus on their expertise, uh, expertise to help the participant navigate different aspects of entering and progressing along a career pathway. You can use the tools and strategies that are located in the Career Pathways Toolkit to develop and strengthen partnerships that lead to co-enrollment and reduce duplications of services. The link to that will be placed in the chat. As many of you know, and many of you have experienced, many states still struggle to fully capture the number of individuals that are co-enrolled and we owe a partner programs. As you can see in the graph on the screen, in program year 2021, only about 5.63% of adult learners in Title II adult education programs were also enrolled in one or more we owe core partner programs. The graph also shows that for the last six program years, less than 10% of Title II adult learners have been co enrolled in we owe core partner programs. We've heard from states that it's been a challenge to collect and report co-enrollment data. And this webinar is in response to that need. Later, you'll hear from different states on ways they are tracking co-enrollment and working to increase the overall percentage of adult learners who are co-enrolled in at least one other WIO or partner program. We hope that some of the information that is shared today will help all of us support adult learners in accessing the great supports and resources that our other WIOA core partners offer. And with that, I'll hand it over to Chrissy for the next portion of the discussion. Chrissy? Thank, thank you so much, Latoya, for getting us started. And we'd like to have some interaction from all of our participants. If you could find your chat and type in some challenges you faced in your state around co-enrollment. And uh, we'll give everyone a few moments to type comments in the chat and see what some of the challenges are, if we have some similar ones. Nancy, I see um, mentioned about referrals and um, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, as we heard Latoya talk about, you know, referrals are where it starts, uh, but we also need to continue to work through all of the requirements for each partner for that co-enrollment. And oh, we great, some people learned some new things about co-enrollment already. Uh, yes, we definitely, that's a good point that we need to uh, develop trust and that can sometimes be a challenge. All right, thanks everyone for all the great response in the chat. We'll go on to the next slide. 
So as some of you have um, mentioned in the chat, um, there are some common challenges that a lot of different states face. So let's talk a little bit about some of these common challenges. And I encourage you to continue to look through the chat as well and see some of the um, information that your colleagues are putting in there. So um, one challenge is the different systems of record. So not all partners in states are using the same system of record and therefore it can be difficult if you have two or three or four systems of record between the partners to share case notes and updates on that shared participant, that co-enrolled customer. Another thing that can be difficult is um, the intake forms and the methods that are used by different programs to collect information. So the staff and the students understanding of the different programs is important and can sometimes be a challenge. And some states cannot do a data match and collect co-enrollment data using intake forms. So again, having those different intake forms and then not having a way to formally share that information can be a challenge. Another challenge that we've seen, and especially I think since COVID, is the staff changes. So we have um, many staff that work well together in some areas and call enrollments going well. And then suddenly there's a staff change and a new relationship needs to be built with new staff members between the staff members, but also with the co-enrolled participant. And there it takes time not only to um, rebuild that relationship, but fill positions, deal with the turnover. Um, and so sometimes that too can lead to a gap in services for the participant. A final challenge that uh, we see uh, several states um, have mentioned in the past is not all of the um, programs, especially the core programs being co-located. Uh, so without being co-located in the physical space altogether, not only can that be a challenge for all of the staff to communicate, but it can also be a challenge for our adult learners not having all of the partners that provide those different services being in the same physical space. So one thing that has been helpful for that challenge is technology, and we've been able to see some areas overcome not being able to be in the same physical space through technology. However, we still see many um, pockets across the country where there is that need to increase access to technology and um, to be able to have all of the different partners um, have that access to technology and be able to um, improve their abilities to communicate with each other about the co-enrolled participant, but also with the co-enrolled participant. Um, so I see a comment too about the um, educational levels. And I think, um, you know, that goes back to one of the earlier comments that we had on the screen too, about really making sure that everybody in the system, both the staff working within the workforce development system and the um, participants that we're serving do understand all of the information. Um, it is difficult to co-enroll if they don't understand um, what benefits they're gonna have themselves of cone rolling and what information is going to be required for them to report. So we do have many benefits to co-enrollment. One benefit is that it does help reduce barriers to participation. So um, we have barriers such as transportation, digital access, childcare, food insecurities, and even mental health. And so by co-enrolling with our partners, we can help reduce some of the barriers that our adult learners face in um, meeting their educational and career goals. Another um, benefit of co-enrollment is um, it reduces duplication of service. So uh, we already heard Latoya mention how it is difficult for us to be everything to everyone and it's important to work with our partners within the system. And so um, by partnering together and co-enrolling, we can help um, bring together different funds that can be braided and um, be able to reduce that duplication of service. And so um, again, through that reduced duplication of services and braiding of funding, it goes back to also reducing some of those barriers. 
and helping adult learners reach their goals, hopefully at a faster pace. Um, as Latoya had mentioned earlier as well, the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act does guide the work that each partner does. Um, so again, it allows us to see where each partner is best suited to provide certain services. And um, it's important that we you know, make sure we understand our different partners, what they can do, and again, have that strong partnership so that if there is a gap in what all the partners can do, we can figure out if a new partner needs to be brought in or how the current partners can work together to address those gaps as well. Finally, um, final benefit of co-enrollment is um, improving those shared outcomes. So we heard Latoya talk about an individual who might be co-enrolled with Title II and Title I a youth program and you know how important it is that they meet the requirements of both those programs. But once they have met those requirements and they are co-enrolled, you might have, let's say, a 20-year-old, for example, that's co-enrolled with the Title I and Title II, obtain their high school equivalency, um, also take advantage of on-the-job training or maybe even some um, post-secondary funding through Title I to go into a high-priority occupation. And so through that co-enrollment, uh, we may see that that learner is going to meet two WIO outcomes, which may include obtaining a credential and obtaining employment. Some of the additional benefits of co-enrollment will be shared today with our four state partners. Uh, again, you may want to save the chat and um, save notes as we go through here, but uh, this will be recorded as well that you can come back to some of the things that states are sharing. Um, we also are going to share some different resources as well, and um, those will be available not just through links, but also through Workforce GPS, which is our Department of Labor partner. Next slide, please. So on the slide there, you can see that chart again that Latoya had described earlier. On the left side, we have in blue our WIOA core partners, Title I, Title II, Title III, and Title IV. And on the right-hand side, we see in red the WIOA additional partners. And we would like to take a moment again to have you engage in the chat if you have um, certain partners that co-enrollment is going well with, um, please put that in the chat. Or are there any partners that you see on either list that you're wanting to learn more about and wanting to find a way to begin to do co-enrollment or increase your co-enrollment number? So we'll give everyone an opportunity. Okay, I see someone put in SNAP. Um, so again, we did talk about that one of the barriers that we see adult learners face is the food insecurity and uh, our Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, our SNAP, can definitely help with that. Um, see some others coming in. Oh, Perkins. Um, Title I Youth. All right, thank you everyone for chiming in on that. So as we hear these promising practices from our four states today, Really think about, as they're talking, who are the partners that they're working with? How is that working? Um, and then compare that to the situation in your state and how you might be able to use um, some of the pieces of what they're sharing to work with some of those partners that um, you mentioned in the chat. So today we will hear from Alaska, Kansas, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. And so we're excited to start with Alaska and I'll pass things over to Wendy to tell us about the work that they're doing in her great state. Uh, thank you, Chrissy. I really appreciate the introduction. So uh, we're gonna talk about increasing integration for successful co-enrollment and what we've done in Alaska. Um, we have a little bit of a different system. So I wanted to start off with uh, what our structure looks like in Alaska here, so you can kind of understand it a little bit better. 
Here it goes. Uh, so they left the Department of Labor and Workforce Development oversees the operation of services provided under all six mandatory WIOA partners. So Title I, Adult Dislocated Worker, Title II, Adult Education and Family Literacy, and Title III, we at Wagner Pizer Services are all housed under the Division of Employment and Training Services. Title I Youth is administered by the Alaska Workforce Investment Board, and Title IV Vocational Rehabilitation has a division dedicated to vocational rehabilitation supports and services. But Alaska has found that having all of the titles in one department has been beneficial and has provided a natural link between supports and services and, of course, co-enrollment. So from the commissioner level to the programs, there is a collaboration that has provided a better understanding of how our programs can build upon partners for that co-enrollment. So we are all housed within the Department of Labor. So we have spent a lot of time over the last four years in particular with trying to break down our silos um, and so Alaska spent that time breaking down the silos to build partnerships. And here are some examples of what we're doing to further uh, interconnectedness within our department and reduce that isolation. So for example, we have department planning meetings, which includes meetings where leadership from different titles are planning, uh, including like we owe a plan, a state planning. Uh, this includes not only the core partners, but our Jobs for Veterans grant, which is our JVSG, and our CSEP grant, which is our uh, Older Americans grant, which we call our MAST. Uh, our MAST. Um, so that includes them as well. We have weekly meetings with our job center managers. So that is our Department of Employment and Training. We meet once a week, sometimes twice a week with Title I, II, and III. Uh, we have general information sharing where we present uh, back and forth, including at like job fairs or stuff like that. We have best practices where we do co-presentations between adult education and job centers. We do cross collaborations between titles, uh, including technical assistance. We have rebranded the Alaska Adult Education. About four years ago, we took the word basic out and we are now just the Alaska Adult Education. Um, we have cross training efforts where we train job center staff from adult education. We also have adult, or we have titles that come in and train adult education. So we have that interdepartmental and partnership training as well. So we are really working hard to break down those silos and build those partnerships throughout um, our whole department. Uh, it's also important to note that in 2020, Alaska integrated into a comprehensive online labor exchange system that we call Alaska Jobs. The system is a single sign-on system that provides an uh, entry point for both individuals and employers. It contains modules for WIOA Title I, II, and III, the Jobs for Veterans Grant or JVSG, uh, the Trade uh, Assistance grant, which is TAA, uh, WATSI, and all of our Alaska state funded employment and training programs. The participant data management and reporting tools allow for federal required common participant performance reporting. And all of our programs as need based upon their individual reporting requirements, but we do have common identifiers to provide data matching for participants, so including co-enrollment. So the common reporting built into the system reduces the need for poll, uh, poll data and for surveying, but rather the data sharing component of the system is built right in. The integrated partnership offers joint accountability requirements between both the PERL, the participant individual record layout, and our NRS reporting data. Uh, we have worked again as a department to help with collaboration, and these are some of the ways that we have done that. 
In the Department of Employment and Training, we consolidated our workforce services and our workforce development units into one cohesive team. And this team, like I mentioned earlier, meets weekly to provide updates, answer questions, and further collaboration uh, between Title I, II, and III. Uh, this is, expands outreach to provide local programs and job center personnel with supports that they need to help collaborate and train. Um, the DETS team has made it a priority to find ways to help co-enroll and how to uh, increase supports for individuals, both in the job center and Title II. Some ways in which we have changed our process is that we have implemented training for Title I, II, and III to better understand the aspects of each title. We have integrated training modules. For example, our job center personnel are now being trained in adult education, working with English language learners and in IET design, while our AE team, our adult education team, is are now being trained in job center functions, how to access service for adult and dislocated workers, and working with the job center and employers. In the spring, we have two conferences, one for adult ed, that's our conference coming up. We have invited job center personnel to come and speak to our teachers about their services. And then later on uh, in the spring, we have a training for case managers for Title I and adult education has breakout groups and we have sessions for a whole group sessions on adult education to help train them on adult education and how to access those services. Adult education Title II local programs must also have processes in place now to align with their 13 considerations and their grant agreement to show collaboration efforts with their local job centers. The AE department or the AE office has developed an on-site monitoring tool, which I'll show you later on how that works. And we also have cross-trained our data validation team. Um, and now we have one team that conducts all of our data, data validation for titles one, two, and three to ensure that the tools and processes are consistent between all the titles. Additionally, uh, the data validation is conducted at the same time that the Title II desk monitoring is conducted, and it is conducted by the same person. So we know that it is accurate and reliable and that the validation is across the board uh, conducted in one way. Like I said, we also go out and monitor our programs. And as on the screen, you'll see a screenshot of part of our monitoring tool that addresses the alignment with our one-stop partners. Um, we, while we're monitoring the programs, we're looking for very specific, we're looking for um, how our programs are aligning with the one-stop partner and how they're, we use this to gauge an understanding of how they're building partnerships. If they're struggling with building a partnership, we use this as a tool to provide technical assistance on our side, but we also use this to have technical assistance built into the job centers through, the, through a collaboration with the job center managers. So it could be either or. We have some best practices that we have found when we're doing this across the state, and I'd like to share those with you now. For example, we have a best practice with our VR. One of our programs has started working with a local DVR program. DVR can't pay for colleges below the college level. So they're having students go to adult education to build upon those skills to become college ready. This is a newer program, but about a third of the students that have come in are now going on to college uh, courses, including our current student service president at that particular college, who started with AE and is now going on to college classes. We also have a best practice of a job center around the state that we have found. Um, it's another program who has a college pathways class in conjunction with their local job center. It's a college and career exploration class. They use the class to explore both college and uh, careers, 
including co-enrolling the students with the job center to work on resumes, cover letters, uh, job searches, having the job center staff help with this class and having staff discuss how Title I uh, can assist with, with funding uh, careers. This class is recommended to all their students, but it's not a requirement. And these are just some of the best practices that we've found when we're working with our sites around the state. Joint tools and training that we have provided for our state or our Title I, II, and III partners around the state is Alaska is working on strengthening partnerships around Title I, II, and III, and we've developed an IET or Integrated Education and Training community uh, around. And we, when we did that, we noticed that uh, Title I and Title II was missing. Uh, we participated in the IET camp and started building these around our state. Um, but with the help of the materials provided by AIR, uh, we put together an IET training series and we brought together a team from Title I, II, and III and trained them all together to help guide these titles in working together to design and build capacities in the IET process in Alaska. We will be looking at training our youth and vocational rehabilitation staff in the, the future, but right now we're just starting with Title I and Title II and Title III and seeing what we can do from there. Um, we also worked on a joint effort to undertake uh, uh, to, to by Title I and Title II, uh, this that is now worked, it's now into our job centers. It's called our basic skills deficiency or BSD form. After conducting research on the methods other states were using, Alaska customized a BSD screening tool to use in the job centers. The idea was to provide this tool to uh, people who are inquiring about Title I services and to have them self-identify, if possible, if they were basic skills deficient. And therefore, they are then referring them to Title II services. The referral program is a case-by-case -case basis, and they're, um, they're co-enrolled where uh, Title I and Title II are now co-enrolling these individuals who are self-identifying themselves as basic skills deficiency. And uh, because Title I is uh, working on priority of service, they are seeing their priority of service now increasing because of these screening tools that are coming in. These are just some of the ways that Alaska is helping to support and work on co-enrollment. Um, and now I would like to turn it over. I'm very excited to introduce Hector Martinez, the Director of Adult Education for the Kansas Board of Regents. And he has some great things to share about what Kansas is doing. Thank you, Wendy. And it's always a hard to follow um, Alaska that um, from Kansas, I just uh, wanted to start with um, saying that uh, Title I and Title II are part of the Department of Labor with the Commerce and Title Title I and Title III are from the Department of Labor, and Title II is with the higher education, and Title IV, it is uh, the vocational rehabilitation on their own. And with that say, um, I would like to share with all of you that there is uh, been different times that we are being sitting on the table uh, with um, other the other core partners on the WIOA to develop some uh, videos and training to have a constant cross train across the board with uh, the four titles. But I like to start today um, and share uh, some steps uh, Kansas is taking to enhance the collaborative efforts of our uh, we all partners. In Kansas, it is highly recommended that Title II uh, providers uh, extend invitations to the one-stop providers to their orientation sessions for new students. On this orientation, students have an opportunity to connect for first time uh, with all the WIOA partners and create a personal contact with the one-stop providers uh, and identify some of their, some of their uh, personal needs. 
Our local providers in collaboration with the local uh, workforce centers will offer a comprehensive overview of the various services available through the One Stop Center. This will ensure that our partners are well, uh, well served in the resources available for them and their clients. Um, same happens to our partners if they have a group of client, clients and enrollees, then Title II, the adult location providers will be present at the workforce centers to offer the similar and uh, retroactive um, information. We recognize that enrolling participants into the appropriate program is essential. Our representatives will guide them through the process to ensure individual are placed into the programs that best fits their needs. And with that, we are working on um, this um, state year plan. We're gonna be in, working on a um, intake form that is similar to what other partners are using. Then in addition, in order to build a direct line of communication between our Title IV partners and our program um, structure is crucial. Vocational rehabilitation is part of uh, every orientation for new participants looking for adult location services and also to identify some of the needs for uh, adults. Uh, this will ensure us to identify any special accommodation that may be required for participants and ensuring that they have the best possible learning experience. We, when we talk about direct linkage uh, system, we really trust on, on the direct linkage is the way that we need to go. And I will address the direct linkage here in a little bit in the next slides. But um, I'm pleased to say that we have a data sharing agreement in place uh, with our partners. Um, and I know for some of you it's a little complicated because of the different systems with the Department of Labor and and even community college systems as we are, then we have a, a agreements where we are um, sharing uh, data and we'll be able to uh, identify those uh, that we possible uh, miss or have not identified in our local programs. But these agreements are uh, to facilitate through the Kansas uh, Board of Regions and the Department of Commerce, allowing us to measure and report co-enrollments co efficiently. This data sharing process helps us track the progress in our programs and ensures that we are meeting our goals efficiently and we are constantly meeting the four, um, the core uh, programs to identify what is missing and what could be um, identified to better have our, our data. Um, I would like to share a um, few um, seconds of a video that I will like to offer to you here in just a, a, a few seconds, but I will invite you to, to go through this video when you had a chance. Long, can you play the video? Thanks for joining us. Welcome to Kansas Workforce One's Direct Linkage Training. The one-stop delivery system brings together workforce development, educational, and other human resource services in a seamless customer-focused service delivery network that enhances access to the program services and improves long-term employment outcomes for individuals receiving assistance. The partners in Local Area 1 Workforce System administer separately funded programs as a set of integrated streamlined services for customers. Our partners are Title I Adult, Dislocated Worker and Youth, Adult Education, You're still muted, Hector. I think that will be good enough long. Thank you. Uh, then I will invite everybody to, if you can share the link into the chat, then they can take some time later on to, to go over um, that. Then to ensure smooth coordination and collaboration among all our partners, we have established a direct linkage system. And, and when I'm talking about this, we used to call this a referral. But the referral, it doesn't seem to be working because the referral, when we refer somebody to one of the agencies that we probably lost 
that contact with those referrals, then we are trying to get rid of that direct linkage. And as you see here in this uh, map, then we have a different um, centers across um, Kansas where we have our agencies or one-stop and local um, workforce centers in, in the state of Kansas. Now, um, in the next slide, you will see that we have distributed adult education across um, the state as well. And with the one-stop centers located across Kansas and adult education services in the same or close locations, we can say that Kansas has a direct contact in, in the backyard. Um, we in Kansas are moving uh, from the referral to, to a direct linkage um, language. And I invite you to uh, really watch the whole video to identify and address some of the direct linkage and how do we address that direct linkage. You will find at the end of the video some examples about how to identify what services and what um, partners can be contacted to some um, scenarios of students coming through um, this training. These trainings are available on each local um, area uh, with the workforce centers. And also when they have their uh, board meetings, they have a cross training for services provided by each one of the um, titles in, in, in WIOA. Now, in, in, in order to empower individuals through co-enrollment, then I'm gonna tell you a, one story that touched various uh, parts of our um, partners on in WIOA. And I'm gonna, um, I'm sure that the student and employee names have been changed, that way we don't identify them. Then I'm gonna read to you that first, the workforce challenge. And Adrian, a WIOA employment specialist, was contacted by an adult education staff at the One Stop Center, who sought to provide a direct linkage for one of their participants. They notified Adrian that they were working with a 19-year-old student named Marie, who was trying to attend her GED, but will need job seeker services upon completion. Adrian met with Maria and determined that she was eligible as a one-stop, uh, as a out-of-school youth due to uh, her having previously dropped it, um, out of the high school. Maria was working part-time but unable to pay for the GED tests herself and had no transportation. Instead, relying on her friends giving her rides to her classes. Maria did know that she was interested in phlebotomy as a career once she earned her GED, which motivated her to continue working on her path. What was the workforce solution? Well, Adrian in encouraged Maria to finish her GED um, and pursue a career in healthcare. Adrian developed an individual, in individualized services strategy with Maria and secure WIOA funding to pay her for her GED tests. Adrian also provided workplace readiness uh, workshops and interest assessment and a virtual job shadow. Maria attended adult education services and passed all of her GED tests with her instructor commenting that she did an amazing job. Now, the outcomes of this uh, partnerships following the completion of her GED Maria continued with her training by enrolling in the hybrid phlebotomy certification program, which she is on pace to complete shortly. Maria was very thankful that she has been able to access the supports and services available through the WIOA Title I program. Upon completion of her phlebotomy certification, Maria is planning to become employed in her local community with her um, completion planning uh, with the opening of a new rural hospital. Until then, Adrienne will continue to be support uh, system in Alice's, Alice's life or Maria's life, ensuring that she obtains and retains employment. Maria is excited that uh, what her future holds and is looking forward to being able to pursue and 
buy her first car. With that, I'm saying that if we work together, this is the power that we can change lives. And with that, I will pass it to Erica. Thank you, Hector. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, my name is Erica Luce from the state of Michigan, and I am so glad to have the opportunity to talk to you about some of the strategies that we have implemented in Michigan to support co-enrollment um, co of adult education participants. So first, I want to briefly highlight our structure at the state level. Um, the Michigan Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity Office of Employment and Training, or LEO ENT, as we refer to it, um, houses all of the core programs that are funded under the four titles of LEOA. And within LEO ENT, there is workforce development, and that's what supports titles one through three. Um, and LEO ENT also includes Michigan Rehabilitation Services and the Bureau of Services for Blind Persons that support Title IV programs. I think it's also important to note that the Talent Development Division in Workforce Development um, includes the Adult Education and Workforce Innovation teams. And so our division director is Krista Johnson, and she is the State Director of Adult Education, and she also, excuse me, also oversees Title I and III. Having that common leadership and working closely with the staff that administer the other core programs has tremendous benefits. The first benefit is having that common vision and mission. So each year, our department releases a strategic plan that outlines the five strategic um, focus areas, broad goals, and guiding principles for our work. And similarly, we have an operational plan that's released that puts those strategies into action, and it identifies the organizational unit that will help achieve those goals and objectives. These plans represent all areas of the department and provide a basis for how each of the core programs support those identified priorities. On the right hand of your screen, you can see a graphic that's the LEO ENT operational plan. What I really like about this document is it clearly and simply shows how the work that each of us do every day supports those key objectives. So for example, we help individuals access programs, get training, earn credentials, gain employment, and increase wages. At the bottom of the plan, it then identifies the metrics and goals for these objectives for that year. This helps us at the state level to see how our work makes a difference, but also the work of our colleagues. The other benefit of being in the same agency is that there are multiple opportunities throughout the year to hear what's happening in those other areas. So for example, we have what we call all hands meetings, um, which are for all staff within the agency, as well as having meetings of the managers and leadership within LEO ENT. Both of these meetings include designated time for updates and sharing of important information. In addition, there are quarterly meetings with our LEO ENT leadership that we have with the executive directors at the Michigan Works Association and also the Michigan Adult Continuing and Alternative Education or McKay Association. These meetings are designed to ensure that the priorities and strategic plans at both the state level and these important associations are aligned and working together. Lastly, there are notifications and regular information that is shared that happens within our agency, including you know, bi-weekly newsletters and individual program area newsletters that are sent to all staff. Um, in 2021, our agency started what we call Technical Assistance Tuesdays. And on Tuesdays, twice a month, a program area or initiative is highlighted and all staff are invited to attend to learn more and ask questions. So some of the topics included in Adult Education 101, there are sessions on WIOA youth, WIOA adult and dislocated workers, ADA and accommodations, and also assistive technology. So these were a great way for us to understand the basics of the different programs and services and to ask questions for those um, lead staff. I think the more informed we are at the state level of the other programs and services, it helps us to provide better direction and guidance to our local program staff. Uh, 
Um, I also wanted to highlight that in Michigan, the data collection system for adult education, which we call the Michigan Adult Education Reporting System or MAERS, is part of the Michigan One-Stop Management Information System that all of the Michigan Works agencies enter data into. And so as you see at the bottom of the page, there's a graphic that shows the login page where the user will select which system they're going to access. Having these two systems joined that share programmers and to share data across the system does have tremendous benefit as, as others have talked about. And we know the challenges when there is not this connection. Um, but in our example, there is a core applicant record that's shared across both systems. And then there can be a registration or multiple registrations for that applicant across any of the systems. So this allows us to share, um, whether it's services, assessments, achievements, it also allows us the ability to track how many of our participants are co-enrolled. At this point, this only would be true for um, participants that are enrolled in titles one, two, and three. The title four does have a separate system, um, but it does provide us a basis for our data sharing. And next, I wanted to talk about professional development. I think in Michigan, we've really tried to use our state leadership funds to support professional development for adult educators across the workforce system. So we have highlighted sessions um, and tried to offer those from other core programs at each of our conferences, um, whether it be our state adult education conference or our McKay Association annual conference each fall. So we try to have representatives from whether it be MRS, Michigan Works, or apprenticeships to offer sessions on their programming and services where we think there's tremendous opportunity for partnerships and collaboration. Um, a lot of the session ideas that we get often come from internal presentations that we have um, had the ability to participate in within our agency. And we'll say, hey, this would be great information for our local programs to have access to. Um, so the benefit of being within the one agency is we know who to go to um, to ask for um, those presentations to be shared. We also have sponsored um, at the McKay Association Conference discounted registrations for Michigan Works or MRS staff to attend to learn more about adult education. Um, similarly, we've sponsored an adult education track at the Michigan Works Annual Conference to try and have more adult educators attending that conference and learning about the different programs and services and just having the networking opportunities. And lastly, when we have created sessions such as um, last year, we did a career navigator training. We also opened those trainings up to Michigan Works and MRS staff to attend. So really trying to look at any areas where we can offer sessions that may be of benefit to our other um, partners and looking for opportunities for us to support attendance of our adult education administrators and staff at workforce um, partner sessions. So I just wanted to briefly talk about um, the adult education footprint in Michigan. So I think this is really important to get a sense of. Um, so in the field, we have many adult education providers that are co-located or are offering services at a Michigan Work Service Center. In the graphic at the bottom of the screen, it shows you the 16 Michigan Works service areas. Um, and we have 23 of our adult education providers have one or more class locations at one of the service centers that are, are generally um, at the county level. And those represent adult education being offered in 14 of the 16 Michigan Works agencies. So we do have wide representation for our adult education services across the Michigan Works system. We have seen about 6% of our participants co-enrolled um, in adult education in other core program services. And I would say that this is an increase of four, from 4% 4 in 2021. Lastly, I just wanted to share um, specifically one area that we've really tried to reinforce co-enrollment. 
Um, and that's related to integrated education and training. A few years ago, we identified expansion of IET programs as a priority in our state. And we felt this was really an opportunity for adult education providers to work with their Michigan Works um, colleagues to create or expand IET program offerings. Um, so in 2018, and then again in 2022, Leo ENT, our agency awarded Title I statewide activities funding to the Michigan Works agencies for development or expansion of IET programs. Under this funding, the Michigan Works providers are required to partner with a Title II um, adult education provider to offer that IET and develop that program. And the benefit of the statewide activities funding is that participants are included in the state performance, but not the local performance. So we, this is something that we heard early on with the creation of IET programs, was a hesitation of Michigan Works to look at adult education participants to use their training dollars for. And so this allowed them to work out and to see that there can be benefit, that our students can be successful, and that they would be able to support those participants with their training dollars. As part of this effort, we offered joint professional development on IET. So we brought together adult education providers in Michigan Works in the same room, the same location, so they could all be hearing the same information about what is IET, how are the programs um, designed, what are the benefits. Um, and then we also had adult education and Michigan Works representation on our state team in the first IET design camp that we participated in. And so I think it was really helpful for both partners to be accessing the same information and working together on those plans. Um, but I will say it's still a work in progress. I think we've, we've seen some real strong partnerships emerge, but more often that's in areas where there was already, you know, that spirit of partnership and collaboration. And so likewise, we continue to see some challenges using these funds in areas that don't have those established partnerships. And so um, we've learned a lot, both at the state level and at the local level, and we will use that to kind of guide our efforts and our technical assistance going forward. So that's a little bit about what we're doing in Michigan. Um, at this time, I'll turn it over to Amanda Harrison to share about um, efforts in Pennsylvania. Hi, thank you, Erica. Um, so first, um, I would like to thank Latoya for mentioning the uh, our workforce staff training modules. Uh, when I was um, asked to, to speak on this webinar. I unfortunately didn't even think of those modules. And um, I have to say that uh, our state leaders, we, the, the interagency team that has developed those modules is led by some staff from our state leadership activities. Uh, Christy is going to be, is involved in that. Um, and they really are doing a great job of, of creating those modules. And those modules are available to um, to all workforce partners. Um, so thank you, Latoya, for mentioning that uh, so that I can call out uh, our team for that. Um, in Pennsylvania, and I have far fewer slides, uh, in Pennsylvania, adult education is based in the Department of Education. The other core programs are housed in the Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry. Um, at the state level, we, we have not established uh, as many formal co-enrollment activities um, as the other presenters have discussed, um, but we know that there are important co-enrollment ha activities happening at the local level in the 22 local workforce areas that we have. Um, those activities are very much tied to local needs and local systems. Um, so there is more co-enrollment in some local areas than in others. Um, and really in order to be able to capture what's happening at the local level, we do a data match with our partners from the Department of Labor and Industry. And we built on a relationship that we already had in place um, from the data sharing agreements that we had under WIA and under the risk for um, wage data for that federal reporting. So because we already had MOUs in place for that, and I knew 
the people who handled the data at labor and industry for uh, uh, titles one and three. Um, we worked together. We were able to kind of have conversations about what data do they have? What do we have? How can we um, work on doing a data match that would get this information for us? So for the data match, uh, we provide a file on a secure site. We provide a file to LNI that has the social security numbers, a unique student identifier from our NRS reporting system, and the start and end dates of each student's periods of participation. So we provide them with that file. And then their Center for Workforce Information and Analysis matches that file with data from their system of record for real programs, uh, which is the Commonwealth Workforce Information System. They provide us through this secure site, a return file that includes all the participants that were on our list who also participated in the other WIOA core programs. Um, the specific core programs they participated in, their participation, their periods of participation in those activities. And then the file also kind of contains, excuse me, it contains a yes, no indicator to let us know whether or not the participation in Title II happened at the same time as the participation in the other four program. Oops, sorry. Um, so for 2021, um, we gave, um, uh, we sent a file to labor and industry that had just under 10,000 rows, 9,661 rows. So that included um, students for whom we had social security numbers and a separate row for each one of the periods of participation for those individuals. Uh, the file that they returned to us had 1,216 rows. So um, just under 13%, 12.6% of the individuals had some kind, had also participated in one of the other WIOA core programs at some point. Of those, 705 participated in um, one of the other core programs at the same time as they, as they participated in adult education. So that resulted in the 5.3% co-enrollment percentage that we reported um, in our federal reporting. Um, for 22-23, our numbers were a little bit lower. Um, we, uh, we sent a file with 10,350 rows. We received one with um, 1,150, so about 11% 11 of the students had participated in one of the other programs at some point. And 608 of those were in Title II and the, one of the other four programs at the same time. Um, so that co-enrollment was about 4.5%. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I seem to have lost my ability to move the slide forward, so thank you. Um, so, what we found looking at that data is uh, the most common co-enrollment is with Wagner Pizer. Um, and I, I don't know, but I suspect that that would probably be an area that would be hard to actually collect co-enrollment data directly from programs. So it, I think um, the, the data match has really benefited us in that area. Um, the second area is with Title I youth, then Title I adult and uh, Title I dislocated worker. We do not have any co-enrollments with the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation because they do not share that information in the CWIS system that labor and industry uses. Um, and I will now turn it over to Chrissy to lead our discussion. Thank you. All right. So. Um... We're going to just quickly uh, put two questions up on the screen and you can feel free to um, put additional questions in the chat. 
Uh, we're not really going to have time to work through these questions too much um, because we've had such wonderful information and we're running a little short today. But what we will do is uh, continue to look at the questions that are in the chat and um, you know continue to have an opportunity to have discussion around some of the things that were shared today in the links community and the career pathways and post-secondary transitions group. So if you can move to the next slide, um, the first question is, how did you strategize in your state plan to focus more on co-enrollment? So, Wendy or Hector, if you could maybe in under a minute give us any tips on that, that would be great. Really quick, um, Chrissy, then this is Hector. Then the, the first thing I will say that is get into um, the table of your next state plan and be um, ready to to share what is, is missing. And one of the things in Kansas, I, I, said, I said it again, is the uh, intake form, then be part of the state plan. And if there is some things that is are missing, um, I will say um, integrated um, data system, we're sharing agreements and, and things like that. Put those into the state plan. Those are um, signed by the governor, then there so be some movements that we can uh, move forward. I agree with Hector. Uh, four years ago, we didn't really have a, we we're in the same department, didn't really have an understanding of what we really needed to do. Two years ago, when we updated the plan, we were starting to get a little comfortable, but still, um, I don't feel like we did it justice. I feel like we're moving in the right directions now um, that we're really starting to understand each other and we're really starting to open those communications. And so I, I feel like the working together with with referrals, co-enrollment, and trying to find like the common intake is essential. And then again, is trying to find, figure out how to um, share your data. Those are the big ones that I feel is the most important. Thank you so much. Let's go to the next question. And again, um, any participants, if you have additional questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. So Erica and Amanda, again, in less than a minute if possible, any tips you have uh, for collecting data about co-enrollment and then validating that data? Sure, I would just say, you know, obviously for us, we have the benefit that our systems at the, you know, base level talk at the applicant applicant record. So we have that benefit. But I think one of the things was eye opening going through this is you still have to look at just because the information is in both system, how it's being reported and what's collected may be different. So for example, when we were looking at sharing assessment information um, for participants across systems, what was collected in one system was very different than what we have in the other. So in mayors, we're asking the form level, the score, very thing versus just very basic information on the assessment. So I would just say it's not just that the information is there, but how it's collected and how it's being reported matters as well. Um, I, I think really, I would just say, look at the data that you're already collecting instead of trying to you know, create new data elements and, and add things. You know, we, we are not collecting any additional data. We have not made any changes to our data system specifically to ask student uh, programs to report on co-enrollment, that we've been able to take what we were already doing as part of data matching and kind of build on that. So if you do already have a relationship um, with, uh, for data matching. Um, so in, in Pennsylvania, the, the <clears throat> Title I and three programs are under the same umbrella as the UC data. So uh, we were able to build on that wage data um, MOU. So if you have that kind of relationship, kind of talking to people and saying, what else can we do based on, on the agreements that we already have in place? Thank you so much to our panelists. I see lots of great comments coming in the chat. It looks like this was a topic that a lot of people were definitely interested in and happy to hear some of these concrete examples that all of you were able to share. 
So on the next slide, we'll just uh, summarize uh, some of our key takeaways from uh, one more slide. <laughs> uh, so again, you know, we started out saying, as you hear our panelists talk today, just think about like who were the partners they were working with and, you know, where are you at the process and how might you take pieces of this and build upon what you're doing? So um, thinking about, do you already have data match for employment and earnings? If so, could you add a column for co-enrollment? Uh, again, thinking about relationships and revisiting relationships. Do you have um, a solid relationship with some of the title programs and not others? Um, again, we talked earlier too about a lot of staffing changes. So, you know, definitely reaching out and continuing to strengthen those relationships as there's staff changes. And think about what you can do to build and enhance relationships across all those title programs. And again, you know, we do have the links in the chat to the Career Pathways Toolkit, which has those great graphics of the different WIOA core partners and programs, as well as some other WIOA programs that can also be a benefit to co-enrollment. So I would like to turn things back over to LaToya to finish us up today. Thank you so much. Um, well, I am... As a final thought, I want to say how grateful I am to serve as the director of this amazing program. I want to say thank you to the Lynx Air team for putting together such a rich presentation. Thank you to our state presenters. Please give them a round of applause or send up some emojis in the chat for them. This was such a rich uh, content filled presentation today. And as Title II, we may be smaller than our partner agencies, but we are definitely mighty. The evidence is in the number of participants we serve, which is more than our partner programs put together. We have the power to tell our story about the services we provide and the students that we serve. And in the spirit of this workforce development system, it's designed to be interdependent and should be symbiotic. And I want you to take a moment to think about that student that you've encountered with multiple barriers to employment and training. They're low income or unemployed, lacking childcare or transportation, new to the United States, have unstable housing or are unhoused. They're justice impacted or justice involved. Now that you have that student in mind, think about the courage it took for that individual to walk through your doors to further their educational experience. Now think about the services our WIOA partners have and that we could help to address all of those needs. Now think about the barriers you face trying to connect our students to these services. Thinking about that, you've now identified opportunities to address those barriers to help our students. You've identified opportunities to think strategically and collaboratively with your core partners. And I know AE practitioners, and I empathize with the desire to meet all the needs of our students. But the reality is we can't do this work alone. Partnership is critical to the success of our students. So with that in mind, I want to say that I'm so grateful for each of you taking your time out today to learn from your peers, to seek these technical assistance opportunities, and doing all you can to improve the lives of our fellow citizens. The success we experience is because of your hard work and your dedication. I appreciate each one of you and look forward to the great work we'll do together. And with that, I'll turn it back to Marcella to close out today's webinar. Oh, thanks so much, LaToya. Um, always so inspirational and it's just wonderful. Um, and I, but I do want to echo what, what she said um, to thank all of our presenters today for sharing their amazing work that they're doing. And um, I, I'm really excited to hear and see how this goes moving forward, all the great things that they're able to share. I hope you do reach out to each of them. Um, Keeping in mind what LaToya shared about really focusing on our students, we're really excited to announce next month's webinar um, that we'll be looking at the impact of adult education. We'll be sharing student stories from different dates, and we're really excited about that. That will be on December 6th. Um, it'll be just like today from 3 to 4.30 p.m. Eastern, noon to 1.30 p.m. Pacific. We encourage you to register now. 
so that you have that already on your calendar and will be able to join us. Um, as always, we, we like to ask what, top, uh, what questions you have on this topic related to the impact that um, adult education has that we can try to make sure that we're addressing in those student stories. Um, so I'll pause there. I also wanna encourage you if you have any questions for our, uh, for our presenters today beyond just can you share um, or even maybe asking those questions so that we can have them put those in the chat for us now while we're still all together, uh, please do so. All right, I'm not seeing any questions, but perhaps that's because you're all so fired up and ready to reach out to your, your WEO partners to get moving with the co-enrollment strategies that you've heard about today. So we won't keep you. Thank you so much for joining. I hope you'll uh, register and join us next month to hear about the impact of adult education. Thank you again to our presenters. Um, thank you, um, and we'll see you soon. Have a great afternoon.